I consider myself very American because I was born in the very middle of our country. I was born in Missouri. And I grew up in Kansas, the very center of the country, until I was um, about 13 years old. I have lived all across America. We moved a very great deal. We moved to a town called Lincoln, Illinois. Well, no sooner had I gotten out of high school than I went to live in Mexico with my father. My father and mother were divorced when I was quite small, and he sent for me to come to Mexico, promising to send me to college. Well, when I got to Mexico City, uh, my father had planned out my whole life for me. He didn't know me very well, and I didn't know him very well, and we hadn't seen each other for 12 years or more. But he told me that he wanted me to go to Switzerland to do college. And I said, well, why Switzerland? He said, because you can learn three languages at once. It's a trilingual country. Uh, it's, they speak what? Italian, uh, German, and French there. And you can learn mining engineering. There's a lot of money to be made out of, out of mining engineering here in Mexico or South America. So you're going to Switzerland to college. Well, I didn't want to learn three languages at once. I didn't want to learn mining engineering at all. So what I really wanted to do was to see Harlem. I'd never been in New York, never seen Harlem. Well, my father was very anti-Negro, although he was Negro in the, Ameri <laughs> in the American sense of the term, you know? Uh, and when I use the word Negro, it's, I use it because it's the most common term, but I could say Afro-American, or I could say colored, or I could say, I don't know what else I could say, but anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, out of deference to those who pre prefer some other term, forgive me because I just sort of grew up on the word and I can't get rid of it. And they call me a Negro poet all the time. And, and my father uh, always referred to uh, American Negroes as being stupid and no good and he didn't think much of them. And why did they stay in the United States where, with all the color prejudice? Because he had run into some very harsh uh, prejudice in his youth. And one of the things that caused him to leave the United States was that as a young man in Oklahoma, he wanted to be a lawyer. No place where he could study law. He took law by correspondence from a Chicago law school. When he applied to take the examinations for the bar in Oklahoma, they wouldn't even let a Negro take the examinations to be a lawyer. And you know how long it took to open up higher education to Negroes in the state of Oklahoma. Well, at any rate, my father, never came back to this country. He practiced law in Mexico City and died there some years ago. I finally was able to persuade him that there was a very good college in New York where you could learn two or three languages if you wanted to and prepare for engineering school called Columbia University. And I didn't tell him I really wanted to see Harlem, you see, at all. If I told him that, he wouldn't have sent me to Columbia. But he did finally pay my tuition to Columbia. Uh, first place I went was Harlem, of course, and most of the time I spent down the hill rather than up the hill. So when it came time to graduate, I hadn't passed uh, physics nor chemistry. I'd only passed French and English. Uh, I don't mean to graduate, I mean to finish the uh, first year. So I wrote my father and I told him that I decided not to try to be a mining engineer, that I had decided to be a writer. Well, I knew my father didn't think anything at all of writing as a profession, and he had reminded me that, that Paul Ernst Dunbar drank a great deal and that Poe died in the gutter from liquor and so on, and, and he had no regard for writing as a, an art or a profession. But nevertheless, I thought I'd be bold and tell him that I wanted to be a writer, which I did. And I said, but if you don't approve of my plans, uh, you don't need to send me any more money. Well, it soon became evident that he didn't approve because he didn't, <laughs> didn't send me another penny. And I found myself in New York City with $13. So I started out in life with that amount of money, and ever since then I've been making my own way in the world. The words of poet and author Mr. James Mercer Langston Hughes from a lecture he gave at UCLA on February 16, 1967, just three months before he left us in May of that year. 
February 1st, the birth date of Langston Hughes, traditionally marks the kickoff of Black History is American History Month, which is perhaps, brothers and sisters, a good time to reflect on the life, work, and words of a brother who, rightfully so, enjoys such high esteem within the culture. So let us, brothers and sisters, reflect on a piece of poetry by Brother Langston, a piece that was written in 1935 and first published in the July 1936 issue of Esquire magazine. But first, because context is key, let us revisit a moment in these United States of America when 56 men from 13 American colonies joined together to throw off their subjection to a king who no longer served their collective wants, will, and hopes for these United States of America. In the spirit of Sankofa, we now go back to fetch the past so that we can reinterpret it into present moments that empower us for the future. Independence Hall Philadelphia. July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Grievance number one. He has refused to assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. Grievance number two. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. Grievance number three, he has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. 
Grievance number four. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. Grievance number five. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. Grievance number six. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. Grievance number seven. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations here, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. Grievance number eight. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. Grievance number nine. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. Grievance number 10. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent here swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. Grievance number 11. He has kept among us in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. Grievance number 12. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. Grievance number 13. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. Grievance number 14. For quartering large bodies of armed troops among us. Grievance number 15. For protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states. Grievance number 16. For cutting off our trade with all parts of the world. Grievance number 17. For imposing taxes on us without our consent. Grievance number 18. For depriving us in many ways of the benefit of trial by jury. Grievance number 19, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses. Grievance number 20, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies. Grievance number 21, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments. Grievance number 22, for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. Grievance number 23, he has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. Grievance number 24. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. Grievance number 25. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. Grievance number 
26. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. Grievance number 27. He has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must, therefore, acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress, assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit, power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, of take the pay of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker, sold to the machine. I am the Negro, servant 
to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, mean, hungry yet today, despite the dream, beaten yet today. Oh, pioneers, I am the man who never got ahead, the poorest worker bartered through the years. Yet I'm the one who dreamt our basic dream in the old world while still a serf of kings, who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone in every furrow turned that's made america the land it has become oh i'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what i meant to be my home for i'm the one who left dark ireland's shore and poland's plain and england's grassy lee and torn from black africa's strand i came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me. Surely not me. The millions on relief today? The millions shot down when we strike? The millions who have nothing for our pay? For all the dreams we've dreamed? And all the songs we've sung? And all the hopes we've held? And all the flags we've hung? The millions who have nothing for our pay? Except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again. The land that never has been yet and yet must be. The land where every man is free. The land that's mine. The poor man's. Indians. Negroes. Me. Who made America. Whose sweat and blood. Whose faith and pain. Whose hand at the foundry. Whose plow in the rain must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again. America, oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath. America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies. We the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain. All, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again by Langston Hughes.